Hey everyone, thanks for clicking on the video. I wanna talk about three ways you can relate to autism better. Now this is mainly geared towards neurotypical people. So people like me, you know, average person, average brain function. Does that mean I'm average? <laughs> anyway, the point is, it's just a way for people who aren't autistic to better understand what autism or having autism is like. Now, I will say that I try to include my sons in this video and they give very brief descriptions of what it's like to have autism, what it feels like to stem. And if you don't know what stemming is, I'll leave a link to uh, that video at where we give a definition. And it's, it just varies from person to person, among my sons, among people on the spectrum, and it is a spectrum, so everyone's gonna have different experiences. So I do wanna emphasize that. Now, also we're gonna show footage of them at the Museum of Natural Curiosity. They were there the other day and there's a lot of sensory play there. And that's actually gonna tie into what I wanna talk about first, which is why, you know, what it feels like basically for autistic people to stim or to have so much sensory input that they feel like, you know, compelled to have a meltdown, right? Now, think about all these experiences you've had in your life where there's been sensory involved that's too much. Maybe you get too much dust in your nose when you're working in construction or something like that and you feel compelled to sneeze. Or maybe you have a really bad migraine and every light and sound and smell is just utterly offensive to you. You just want it to go away. Or maybe it's like a bad hangover or something like that. Or maybe if you've been really pregnant, you understand what it's like to have certain smells that just trigger you. And that's what it's like for a lot of people on the spectrum. Not everybody, but for a lot of people, they feel this compulsion to get away from those types of sensory triggers, right? And it's different for everybody in the sense that there are certain smells that they might not like, certain smells they might like. And that's another thing too, is sometimes they crave sensory input. Like our youngest, he craves flannel. He loves the feel and sensation of flannel. I don't personally get it, but that's the point of this video where you've had something in your life that you've loved. Like think of it this way. My wife, she loves to go swimming and we went out to Palm Springs one year. We have a video of us going out and just having a great time in the cool shade, the cool pool, because it's like 120 some odd degrees outside, right? And it's ridiculous, but in a way we actually enjoy that because it feels just so good to jump into the pool and have that cool sensation of water all over your body. And so for a lot of people on the spectrum, that's what it's like when they get that sensory input they crave, whether it's you know being squished, having their body compressed, or it's touching a certain fabric or material. Um, it could be like smooth marble or something like that. Um, that's kind of along those lines where you know, our brains and our nervous systems crave certain sensory input or reject certain sensory input. Um, I, I hope that helps you relate a little bit better to that. The next thing I wanna talk about is just how literal the autism brain can be. A lot of times uh, certain humor is wasted on people on the spectrum and, and a lot of people have noticed that. And I think that one of the reasons why is they just love, you know, stereo instructions, very literal, matter of fact, give it to me straight. And I like that a lot. I like that, especially about my oldest son, Ian. He's very literal, very honest. He, he just wants you to give it to him straight and no nonsense. And even though I love deadpan humor and sarcasm, sometimes he has also reminded me why I love uh, people who can be very literal and very uh, forthcoming and outright. Yeah, how, how do you relate to, to something like that? Well, maybe you've been in a party or something like that and somebody tells a joke and it just goes way over your head. But rather than say anything, you just kind of sit there like, ha, 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 that's funny. You know, like you, you want to be a part of the, the group and you want to understand what the joke meant. But at the same time, you feel like it just completely passed you by. And maybe because you were overanalyzing it or you were thinking of something else or whatever. And that's what it's like to a lot of people on the spectrum. They're just like, I, I don't get it, you know, per se. Or they might understand why the humor connects, but it just doesn't hit them in the same way. Anyway, that's one way to relate to autism is like if you've ever missed a joke or a punchline or something like that, it can be that way for a lot of people on the spectrum. The third thing I want to talk about is how the autistic brain can get information overload or it could be overanalyzing, however you want to put it. Now, maybe you've been in a first semester course in you know, a university or maybe it's a math class or something like that and you've just felt absolutely overwhelmed by all the information that's just coming your way and you don't know quite how to process it. It's a little intimidating, it's a little overwhelming, and it can be that way for a lot of people on the spectrum where they receive information that maybe we take for granted or we've been so used to. When they receive it, they're like, wow, this is just too much. This is just, and it might, again, it might seem simple to us, but to them, it's just overwhelming. 
And so put yourself in their shoes. Like, again, maybe you've been in a class or received instruction or felt out of your depth when uh, being in some kind of curriculum or course or something like that, that just was like, I'm never going to get this. I, I'm never going to understand quantum physics or, you know, pre-calc or whatever it is. And uh, that's, I think one of the reasons it's that way for a lot of people on the spectrum is if you look at the brain scans of people who are asked questions on the spectrum, their brain doesn't necessarily respond the same way to questions that a neurotypical brain does. And what I mean by that is a neurotypical brain, if asked a question, we try to sort things almost immediately and create a linear path of information. So if someone says, you know, what color is an elephant? We have the picture of the elephant in our brain, and then that connects to the color gray, right? It's just a A to B type thing. Now, for someone on the spectrum, it might be a little bit different. If, if asked what color is an elephant, well, they don't just think of like the, the common answer, the, the answer everyone wants to hear, which is gray. They're like, well, what if the elephant's covered in mud? And what if it's in India? Well, then it's kind of a reddish mud, you know? And, and so their brain just kind of scatters in all these different directions and, you know, all their neurons are firing. And I think it's a more comprehensive way of thinking and answering questions. So you might actually get a better response. It's almost like, I hate to say this because I'm a little bit terrified of AI, but it's almost like an AI response where it kind of like scours the web and scours these databases to get information and bring that back to you in the form of an answer. Whereas a person might just be like, it's gray. Come on. How, how difficult was that? It's gray. And for, for us, for people with neurotypical brains, that seems like the very quick, you know, accurate response. But there's a lot of nuance in life, right? And I think people on the spectrum, they see that nuance and it can be very difficult for them to process all that information all at once, especially visual information, and just give a simple answer. So I notice when asking questions to my kids, sometimes they'll pause or they'll be like, but what? But I, you know, and they'll just kind of stutter and they'll, it's almost like their brain is just like calculating, calculating, and you can see the little, you know, spinning loading wheel. And that's not a bad thing. It's just them processing information differently. So I'm, again, I'm sure you felt overwhelmed at some point in your life with information. And that's how it can be a lot of times for people on the spectrum. Ian, can you tell me how you feel when you stim? Well, my mind thinks very deeply and my body feels nice and nice and cozy and warm somehow. I don't know, it just it just happens, you know. So can you tell me about the feelings that go on in your body before a meltdown? Hmm. Well, first, the signs of meltdown. Well, if I'm, if I'm feeling stressed in the inside of me, like at my gut, if I feel very stressed in the inside, that's a sign. If I'm breathing heavy, which I'm really tempted to melt down, that's another sign. Alistair, what does it feel like when you stim? I just like, I just like, I just like Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. You like Zelda Tears of the Kingdom? What, what does it feel like when you stim? When you move your hands and you run around and have a good time? Because I'm so excited and, and squishy and happy. You're so excited and squishy and happy? Yes. <laughs> so you stim when you're happy? Yes. Yeah. Hey, buddy. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> so I think I've said enough. I, I hope you appreciated that and, and seeing some of the footage of my kids playing over at the museum there. And yeah, we just appreciate all of you. We love all of you, all of you on the spectrum who are autistic. Uh, you're wonderful. Uh, don't let people try to convince you that you're bad because your brain works a different way or anything like that. And with that, we're going to end the video and we'll see you next time.